Hello and welcome. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. Today, we're going to talk about Bitcoin news today. We're going to look at governments, government banks, plus the COVID-19. Does that equal digital currency? That is becoming very, very interesting. In fact, the public may demand that government central banks begin creating digital currencies because people don't want to be infected by viruses with their money. Where did the Bitcoin go? There are millions of Bitcoin that may have been destroyed. And where did it go and what happened to them? We're going to dig deeper into that topic. And then finally, there's an ex-Goldman Sachs executive who is investing 25% of his, his portfolio, his wealth, into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So we have some great news today. Hang on, we're going to go for a wild ride. So should I buy Bitcoin now or wait? That's one of the questions that we ask with, this, with our videos because we're going to give you ideas to help you take profits and avoid losses. Now, can we get this video to 99 likes? Smash the like button. It really helps us out. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. So let's take a look at this. The world might see central bank digital currencies sooner than anybody expected. The central bank of central banks and multiple analysts that think the fear of the coronavirus transmission via cash and bank cards may shorten the road to a central bank digital currency, a CBDCS. People are afraid of using cash, says the Bank for International Settlements. In their recent bulletin, the scientific findings conclude that the chances of transmission are high via frequently touched objects made of non-porous materials, which include credit card terminals and pin pans, pin pads, and there are no known cases of transmission via banknotes or coins, says the BIS. Nonetheless, people are far more concerned about cash than plastic or stainless steel. The pandemic may hence put calls for CBC, CBDC, central bank digital currencies, into sharper focus, highlighting the value of having access to diverse means of payments and the need for any means of payment to be resilient against a broad range of threats, the BIS concludes. So it's interesting, here we have a situation where public fear is overriding medical science. Medical science says that you're far more likely to get uh, the virus from hard objects rather than soft objects. So an object like a dollar bill is less likely to transmit the virus than a hard object like a plastic credit card or even um, you know the pin pads uh, at, at the at the ATM machine or at some other place where you're entering in a pin pad. So very interesting. My wife is requiring me to use my knuckle instead of my fingertip when uh, putting in pins into uh, different things, whether it's a pin at the gas station or a pin at the grocery store uh, when we're using you know, the, the, the devices that you have to put in your credit card and then it asks for a pin, et cetera, et cetera. So COVID-19 might turn out to be the catalyst that finally brings digital payments fully into the mainstream, they write. The pandemic accelerated a shift towards digital payments will be particularly seen with young populations and particularly in Asia, specifically in China, they find. Well, in China, they're already using the cell phones uh, for payment purposes far more than they use credit cards or even physical dollars. Uh, China is very, very uh, ahead of the game when it comes to using cell phones for payments. And, and uh, cell phone payments, they... Anyway, uh, cell phones for payments is used far more than a physical credit card uh, ever has been in China and some of the other Asian countries. Long-term winner will be society as a whole. Short-term winners will be the fintech and crypto industries, but adding that the elderly and the unbanked will be short-term losers. In a recent video 
Arslanian also discussed two opposite events, quantitative easing for fiat and the Bitcoin halvening, saying that these two will make us think of how money is created and its role in society. So quantitative easing, as everybody already knows, is when the government uh, adds more money to the economy. They just print more dollar bills or they electronically transfer more money to banks. However they move it, they are actually increasing the supply of money um, whereas with Bitcoin, the supply of money is going to get cut in half with the Bitcoin halvening. Uh, what creates new money with Bitcoin is when miners add blocks to the blockchain and the amount that miners get rewarded per block is going to cut, be cut in half in a matter of weeks. It's going to be sometime uh, around May 11th-ish uh, 2020. So the interge introduction of CBDCs and crypto as these can make the monetary system faster and more efficient increases financial inclusion and reduces the scope for money laundering and tax evasion. So central bank digital currencies and cryptocurrencies is going to increase and make money faster. I mean when you compare using Bitcoin to transfer money to, to anywhere around the world, somewhere uh, whether it's uh, South America or Europe or anywhere else, the speed of time and the cost for transferring any kind of cryptocurrency to another country anywhere around the world is significantly less and significantly faster than any of the current modern ways of doing it via banking. When you go to a bank, they charge you an enormous amount of money, you know, uh, uh, large percentages of what you're transferring gets gets captured by the bank as fees um, and it can take days or weeks if you want to transfer money to Europe or somewhere else in the world. And so uh, whereas with Bitcoin it may take a few minutes but that's pretty close to instantaneous when you're talking a comparison to days and weeks. So that and with uh, uh, governments with cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and most of the others, uh, governments have complete access to see how much each address has, who, where they transferred it, what they used it for, etc., etc. And so governments have uh, 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 access into how cryptocurrency is used uh, to a far greater degree than they've ever had with cash. With cash, there's there's no traceability with it, but with Bitcoin, every transaction is traceable uh, all the way back to that the moment when that particular coin was created or mined in the case of Bitcoin uh, and, and other currencies. It, it just depends on the cryptocurrency because other cryptocurrencies use other mechanisms in order to create their coins and add new coins into their systems. So all of that adds to the government's ability to uh, deal with things like money laundering and tax evasion uh, makes it much easier for them. And of course, you know, any kind of, anything that the central banks are going to come out with is also going to have a lot of features that aid the government when it comes to money laundering and tax evasion. Um, plus, uh, central bank digital currency is going to be much more faster and more efficient uh, than the current fintech, the current financial technologies that are being used to transfer things uh, around the globe by current banks in the current banking system. So it's quite interesting. I never would have expected that the, the virus pandemic would affect the central bank digital currency creation and, and actually speed it up. So I thought this was quite interesting. How many Bitcoins are there and the difference between real and capped supply? So despite that there's a 21 million Bitcoin cap placed on Bitcoin lost coins, hacks, and user error have ensured that a large portion of this cap supply will never re-enter circulation. So Bitcoin's supply is capped to a maximum of 21 million coins, but the real supply is much lower. Coins have been erased or lost for various reasons over the years. Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin's anonymous creator, accounts for almost all the Bitcoins that have been lost. There can be only 19.5 million Bitcoins at max uh, when, when uh, the last Bitcoin is mined, and that will be sometime in 2140. Yes, 
I did say 2140. So we have probably a, a hundred years or so before we actually see the last Bitcoin actually mined. And the current real supply is somewhere around 16.8 million Bitcoin. And that's including the ones that uh, have probably been lost, but there's some that it's impossible to know that they're actually lost at this point in time. Bitcoin scarcity is a vital aspect of its value proposition. The project's anonymity create, anonymous creator Satoshi Nakamoto designed the network with a cap supply just shy of 21 Bitcoin. But after accounting for coins that are lost, however, many Bitcoins are actually uh, inaccessible. How many Bitcoins are actually accessible? What is the actual real usable supply? Unlike cash in a bank when the private key or seed phrase for a Bitcoin wallet is lost, those coins are gone forever. An online banking or ATM pin can be reset by the bank and, uh, has, and the bank has ultimate control of all of those accounts. Bitcoin is a self-custodial asset. In other words, you as the Bitcoin owner are the self-custodian. This means that if a user loses their coins, it is impossible to retrieve them. Now, this is not the case if the coins are stored using a third-party custodian, for example, an exchange or other value-add service. So, you know, it's always recommended that you don't leave your cryptocurrency on an exchange. And the main reason for that is there have been you know, in, in the last 10 years during the life of Bitcoin, other than people, the, well, the vast majority of fraud and the vast majority of issues and the vast majority of people being hacked or stolen um, or losing their cryptocurrency has been via exchanges. Uh, there's been stories, well, there have been exchanges where the owners of the exchange look like they may have ran off with Bitcoin. There's been exchanges where the exchange went out of business and everybody that had Bitcoin on the exchange uh, has either lost or had a great difficulty in getting their Bitcoin back or their finances back from the exchange. So there's been a host of different reasons why uh, putting your cryptocurrency on an exchange is a risky venture. But self-custodying it can also be a risky venture because you run the risk at losing what you've used for the self-custody. That's why I recommend using a hardware wallet. Um, I, that's what I use for myself and that's what I've recommended to my family members. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. And, and my, my opinion is that you should self-custody and that you should use a hardware wallet and then find somewhere safe to keep the seed phrase for your hardware wallet. Um, and keep, keep in mind that anybody who gets the seed phrase, if they get a brand new version of the same hardware wallet, actually could access whatever you have stored in that cryptocurrency wallet. So, you know, it's very important to keep the seed phrase safe and also very important to keep the hardware wallet safe. Um, but just something to consider. So tracking real supply, CoinMatrix, a data firm covering the crypto space, ran the numbers to estimate the total amount of Bitcoin that has been locked away forever. To do this, the firm undertook a rigorous UTXO or unspent transaction output analysis and looked at coins that have been dominant since July 2020, dormant, sorry, dormant since July of 2010. Now, their research concluded that as of November 2019, over 1.5 million Bitcoins have been effectively burnt or lost. In the world of crypto, the term burnt is another way of saying the tokens are lost forever and no longer contribute to a network's contributing supply. Surprisingly, there are five factors that contributed to this number. Firstly, when Satoshi ran the, and mined the first Bitcoin block, the first 50 Bitcoins mined were never included in a UTXO set. That means these coins never existed, though the transaction for mining them was real. So the transaction for mining them was real and they have actually reduced the total supply of Bitcoin by that 50. Second, there are two sets of identical digital signatures for four different transactions where a miner receives their block reward. And it goes into details, but basically those four transactions uh, wipe out each other. And so 
uh, those transactions only actually occurred half of as many uh, uh, cryptocurrency blocks as intended. And as a result, the blocks that were mined only half actually exist, but the other half actually impacted the total amount of cryptocurrency. And then third, there were two blocks at which miners didn't claim their block rewards and another where a miner didn't claim the, their transaction fee reward. Uh, th and that's a total of 20.5 Bitcoin. And then fourth, some amount of Bitcoin was sent to burner addresses, all but one which was cryptocurrencies were bogus addresses, burning a total of 2,214 Bitcoin. And then the final reason for lost Bitcoins is related to zombie coins. These are coins that haven't moved in nearly 10 years. They account for a majority of mined coins that are no longer part of a circulating supply. The only data point here is 1.496 million Bitcoins that were mined by Satoshi and never touched. In fact, none of Satoshi's addresses have ever shown any transaction history. So kind of interesting that Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin, mined a lot of Bitcoin, uh, 1.496 million to be exact, and yet never touched any of it other than creating those cryptocurrencies. Those cryptocurrencies have never been used in any transactions, never exchanged on a, tr on a traded on any of the exchanges, never converted back into cash, et cetera, et cetera. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to use some of that 1.496 million Bitcoin, you know, at a $6,000 price for Bitcoin or $7,000 price for Bitcoin? That's that's $7 billion worth of funds right there. Quite a, quite a large chunk. So ex-Goldman Sachs executive shifts his portfolio to Bitcoin and Warren's worst insolvency event in history is coming. Uh, Raul Paul, a former Europe hedge fund sales lead at Goldman Sachs, is preparing for the financial system to enter a massive world of hurt. I think the balances of probabilities are that this is a much longer event in terms of the economic impacts, and I think it's going to be the largest insolvency event in all of history. Paul believes that the incoming crisis will be so bad that it will permanently change the psyche of the next generation. This is a generational change. What it does is the younger generation will look upon everything differently forever. They will look upon with some suspicion the pension system, which is going to fail in this. They're going to look across securities markets in ways that they will think, this is just not for me. And they will have different opinions on risk and savings than previous generations. Millennials have already been scared by the 2000 and 2008 financial crises. They don't trust the financial system. They will reject what went before them, and they will embrace things that are new and different. To protect himself from the aftershocks of the coronavirus pandemic, Paul reveals that he is shifting a significant portion of his wealth into Bitcoin. Of the liquid net cash that I have available, my allocation that I want to be in for the next 12 months, probably, uh, maybe longer, is 25% Bitcoin, 25% gold, 25% cash, and 25% trading opportunity. So I'm curious what he means by trading opportunity. That, that is something I would like more details on, but unfortunately this article does not dig into that. Alrighty, so that is the news for today. How can I be of service to you? If you have questions or comments, please leave them uh, in the comment section below on the YouTube channel, preferably. In the meantime, I hope that you'll like, subscribe, and hodl, and have a fantastic day.